we'll kick off. Uh, you know, it's uh, for those who came on time, it's always good to start on time. Um, my name is Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department here at the School of Professional Studies within NYU. And we work within the Division of Programs in Business. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that um, this occasion gives me a chance to welcome Tim Breuer from IBM uh, to our community. Um, Tim runs uh, communications for the IBM cloud data platform uh, as the VP of communications there. there. And uh, we all, uh, you know, I think eagerly uh, await uh, his comments and the conversation that we'll have with him, uh, both about the field of communications um, broadly, which is, you know, the, the purpose and goal of our programs, but also more specifically about AI and its impact and, and the position that IBM has taken. Um, this also gives me an opportunity to thank again uh, a very esteemed colleague, uh, Professor George Benaroya, who's been uh, leading these global, uh, leading global growth series of conversations, uh, who's a constant inspiration to all of us, I think, in the faculty to uh, do more for our students and, and, and really, uh, you know, curate and nurture a very real world hands on approach to uh, their education, which I would like to think is a watchword of uh, of what we do in the school more generally, but uh, my many thanks to George. And if I, I forget, or in case I forget, um, a shout out to both Patrick Brady and Robin Smith, who have worked in the background to make this a reality. So uh, without further ado, um, we are recording the event, as you know, uh, there will be opportunities for Q&A, uh, you know, start by using the Q&A box uh, that should be at the bottom of your screen if you're in as, a, uh, as an attendee. Um, and we will attempt to get to all the questions. And I know that George uh, has a number of students already uh, teed up to ask questions. So back to you, George, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Super, thank you so much, Michael. And yes, for those of you who have just joined, uh, I'm George Benaroya. In the day I work as a CFO, I started my career at Procter & Gamble, then Petro Pack, Media, and now I work in private equity. And once per week, I get to do something I love, and that is to teach this finance class. Let me explain what's happening. You've joined a real class going on now at NYU School of Professional Studies. So we are not actually actors. And uh, what we do is, on the first session, students pick a company, any company that they want, and they pick the idea. And then they learn about finance by making one business decision each week. The first one is about headcount. How do we persuade IBM to give us more heads for marketing or communication? So what Julia did was to look at the revenue of IBM over the last two years, and then the options that IBM has. Regina made a recommendation to increase the headcount, uh, and she explained why, uh, you know, giving each one of the different reasons and so on. Now, the trick in this class is that there are no right or wrong numbers. What we do is we learn how to use numbers in a meaningful way to persuade others. So Georgina used the same idea of trying to get more heads for marketing, but she gave examples of different business deals that IBM had won. Today in the US and in parts of Europe, we have supply chain problems. There is not enough product to sell. Now, I've been teaching this class now for two years, and uh, what Amy did when she was in that situation was to propose basically whether to choose from old clients or new clients. Now, what is interesting is that before the pandemic, the class was split. So some of them said, let's go get new clients. This is our only chance. But what you see on the right hand side is that during the pandemic last year, no one did. Everyone felt that we should prioritize all clients. How do you deal with inflation and price increases? This is how Yi had did. She proposed a 2% overall price increase, but in some cases it was a price decrease and in others a price increase of 5%. How do you communicate that to clients? This is how Preston would do it. And when you look at this letter, it looks so real that sometimes I'm tempted to call on that 914 number and see what happens. But then what do you do if clients reject 
the pricing rates. So we learn how to do that in class as well. And then the last part is to invite senior executives from this company who are making the decisions in real life to tell us how they do it. So today with us is Tim Brewer, Vice President, Communications, IBM Cloud. Now I prefer to do introductions more at a personal level. And I think what is interesting about Tim, in addition to the fact that he's a vice president, that he worked in internal communications for many years, is that when I Google his name, he has written about a variety of subjects, going back at least to 1995. I think he's been at IBM for more than 30 years, but he can tell us. And so next time that I need to communicate something in a professional way, I'll just Google his name and see how he did it. Please join me to welcome Tim Brewer. Oh, thank you so much, um, uh, Michael and George and everyone joining the class today. It's a real pleasure to be joining you and talking to you about AI and IBM and the way that AI is helping to change the world and society. It's uh, my pleasure. Great. So, Regina, would you like to go with your first question? So, hi, team. This is Regina. And I would like to ask, how is the development of AI technology accelerating social digital transformation? And how can companies make better this digital transformation post-pandemic by using hybrid uh, cloud platforms? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a great question. And I think I'll answer it in two steps. First, what are the technical barriers that things like data management technologies and AI are helping organizations to uh, get through and to, and to achieve end outcomes? And then I can give some practical examples. So first, when you look at the technical barriers that AI is helping organizations to take on, it's really all about extracting value from data, right? That's the value that AI provides. Uh, the things that data management platforms and AI are doing are helping clients to find data, they need to manage data. They need to curate data. They need to refine it in a way in data models that will make sense. And to put that in perspective, if you think back to, for example, the Industrial Revolution, that was an era in history that was fueled by natural resources. And it's very similar. If you think about iron as an example, industry was looking to discover iron. They needed to mine it. They needed to refine it to extract value from it. And that drove a tremendous boom for the economy. Similarly today with data, it's the same process. AI alone doesn't work without tools that will help um, different organizations get value from that data. At the same time, there's enormous uh, amounts of data in the world today. And you need AI technologies to go out and apply insights to analyze and study that data. We're talking about hundreds of millions of different you know, blogs and papers and videos. Think about all the things we study manually as people today. We can't get to all of it. And so we need AI that can do that with much greater speed and much greater precision. So just to give you a sense of how much data is in the world, um, just by show of hands, if we could in the class, um, I wanna know if, if anyone's familiar with the market research firm IDC. Okay, let me just, one, thank you, thank you, George. So IDC is a market research firm. They look at trends in information technology as one of the things they do. They also look at uh, vendors like IBM and, and rate vendors in terms of um, their products and services, similar to Gartner and other firms like that. So IDC went out and tried to get an estimate of how much data was in the world. They did a lot of calculations and they said there's about 175 zettabytes in the world growing at an annual compound growth rate of about 61%. Now, one more time, promise is the last time I asked for a show of hands, you don't have to answer the question, but does anyone in the room have any idea how much data is in one zettabyte? Good, because neither do I. I don't have a clue when I work in the IT industry. Fortunately, IDC gave a little bit more perspective. Again, just to give you a slight idea, all of us a slight idea of how much data is out there and the value that data provides. So IDC said that one zettabyte, and remember in the world we're talking about their estimate of 175 zettabytes in the world, is the equivalent of a trillion gigabytes. And so you take that trillion, multiply it by 175, 
We know the average store phone recommended storage on an iPhone, I think is about 128 gigabytes. You just get to get a slightly better sense that that's a heck of a lot of data. It's a 175 with an enormous number of zeros behind it. And to give more sense of, of how much data that is, IDC went a little bit further. They said, if you took 175 zettabytes of data and stored it on Blu-ray discs and then stacked them, they'd stack from here to the moon 23 times. What do we know from that? It's just a small picture of the sheer volume of data. And we need data and AI management tools. We need AI tools and data management tools to really harness all of that data. Now from IBM research, we know about 90% of uh, corporate data goes unanalyzed. That's due to the sheer volume. And it's because we have AI tools and we'll get into details throughout the session here today that can get to enormous volumes of data very accurately to understand them, to, to apply human cognition based thinking to that data and come up with analysis. And then we know the benefits. We know the clients that use IBM's AI technologies get to data-driven predictions 50% faster, and they get about 50% of their time back due to the productivity. So I thought that was just a, a good way to open, right, to talk about the ways that AI and data can help. Now, I think the second two parts of the questions were some examples of AI and digital transformation, say with a business and also help, also how, excuse me, AI is helping with different social issues. One example from a digital transformation standpoint, um, everybody knows the North American retailer Carhartt, I assume. They make weekend and work where very successful company, they've experienced you know, record holiday sales, overwhelming demand. They've gone from, I think, 100 million to nearly a billion in sales. Now with that kind of success comes growing pain. So Carhartt partnered with IBM and we developed an AI-based system to look at all that data, right, in terms of industry trends and more accurately model the demand for their products, which helps them to respond better. They're also now working with us on an AI system to help automate the replenishment of their inventory systems. And again, all of that's based on an understanding of an awful lot of data and that ability to compute those insights through AI tools at much greater speed than people alone can do that. The end result, their, their cloud systems are about 45% more efficient. So you can see the benefits there. And then finally, I think the last part of the question was around um, social issues. I think a really good example is the work that IBM and others in the industry are doing around eliminating bias in AI. And bias can creep into AI-based decision-making just as it can in, in human-based decision-making. And so IBM makes AI tools that help our clients detect and, and eliminate bias in real time as a transaction is, is happening. To give some sort of real world context for that, anytime, for example, you apply for a mortgage for a loan, or if maybe you're applying for a job at a company, there's a really good chance that there's some level of AI decision making going on behind the scenes, looking at the data, trying to help the companies make a decision. Now, to look at potential bias in AI, let's say you lived in a, in a particular part of the United States that had a zip code that was, and you were applying for a loan, say applying for a mortgage, and you're in a zip code that had a particularly high rate of defaults on mortgages. Yet at the same time, you're a really good banking customer. You paid off all your loans on time. In fact, maybe even paid off loans early. You'd want that AI decision-making. You wouldn't want to default on that loan based on that one piece of data or limited data alone. So we make tools to help with that. The last thing I'd end on, I think, for this question is, in terms of AI and, and, and bias, really important for companies today, particularly with regulators, with clients and business partners, that they can fully explain how an AI decision was made. You know, you want transparency, you want explainability, and we offer tools to, to help with that as well. Super, I think that's a real good example. Yeah, we have a few minutes, yeah. Hi, Tim, this is Yihan. Uh, I want to ask, what is IBM's core competence in AI? Thank you very much for that question. And um, as a PR person at heart, I love to talk about IBM's competency. So I really appreciate that. Look, I'd say it's all about our collective competencies in AI. 
That's across a number of areas where IBM helps our, our clients, governments, society with AI solutions. It's AI software, it's an AI consulting, it's an IBM research. We have the pre preeminent group of uh, you know, IT researchers in the industry, our systems. And I'd also you know, argue in both our software, our practices and policies around fairness in AI, you know, some of the things we just talked about, about making sure that AI is, is modeled in a way to eliminate bias. From an AI software standpoint first, there's three different categories of software IBM sells. The first is something around a, a category in the industry known as natural language processing. What does that mean? It's a term in the AI industry where AI can be trained to both understand the unique language, in fact, languages of people around the world. Not only what we're saying, but you think about colloquialisms and slang. You think about syntax, you know, the meaning of words, syntax, the meaning of words within a sentence. AI models need to be able to train and understand those different elements of language to be able to then apply cognitive-like abilities to make decisions based on it. But at the same time, they need to be able to understand the unique language of business. So if you think about, we all take for granted if we're dealing with a bank, we know what interest means, even though interest has multiple meanings. If you're dealing with a healthcare provider, the word premium is very specific. It needs to be able to understand that and by the way, understand that data again against, against a corpus of an enormous amount of information and make decisions. Second form of the software we offer is AI-driven software for automation. We have AI systems software that understand both how IT works. So if you think about AI models that are understanding how a system's working, think maybe go back to Carhartt. I'm not sure we're applying this with them or not, but they're getting an enormous amount of demand and they want to adjust either their networks or servers, the AI can actually help address that to um, eliminate bottlenecks in the system. Again, an emerging field in AI called AI ops. And then that software for um, trusted data to eliminate bias and make sure models are extremely explainable and clear. Consulting for AI, our consultants have a very unique combination of deep industry expertise, really understanding the ins and outs of an industry and then being able to understand our AI technologies and then being able to help apply that technology to help uh, design, implement, and manage an AI-driven system to help that industry um, excel. Uh, our systems, um, all of us do banking, all of us deal with retailers. There's an overwhelming possibility for all those transactions at IBM Z. That's our system that manages billions of concurrent transactions are behind those, enabling them to happen on time accurately and securely, AI capabilities in our systems. And then finally, um, in research, we had about 9,100 patents, about 2,300 plus in AI um, last year. We're taking that data and all of our innovations and advancing the field of AI. One good example there is something out of our research labs called Project Debater. Project Debater is the only AI system that's capable of debating humans on complex topics. And again, it's all about the data, right? So if you look at the corpus of data that Project Debater was based on, it's based on 400 million articles and 10 billion sentences. You need those tools to be able to analyze those incredible amounts of volume to come up with solutions. The end result, um, today we've got about 40,000 Watson client engagements. Watson is our, our AI brand. Nearly 90% of the Fortune 500 are relying on IBM AI technologies and solutions. And it's clients we, we, you know, we, we, all know, we all know and work with, everybody from Nike to PayPal, GM Financial, K, KPMG, Lufthansa, and many others across a, a range of different industries. Thanks so much, Tim. So that you know what we do on these sessions is they're open to anyone. So anyone from anywhere in the world can ask questions and you'll get later on questions from Europe and Asia and so on. Now, some of the students, going back to what you were saying about cons the consulting business, right? They're pretending that they work for IBM as consultants. And some of them specifically with artificial intelligence, right? So they're learning, you know, through your presentation, how to sell to, to potential clients. Uh, the IBM framework and so on. They also learned that IBM has more patents than any other US company, which is 
points uh, quite amazing. So we're going to go now to one of the recorded questions. Patrick, will you play that question, please? Hi, Tim. My name is Itong, and my question is, what are your concerns about artificial intelligence? Thank you. Another great question. Thank you for that. Um, look, I think I'd build on a concern, but that I think the industry is really doing um, a great job at addressing, and that is back to fairness in AI. But it goes beyond the answer I gave earlier, so I think it gives some more perspective. A couple things just to consider. The there's different types of bias that can show up in decision-making in an AI. There's one thing called anchoring bias. That's where a data model might make a decision based on the first piece of information or the most prominent piece of information in the model. You know, if you think back to that example that I gave for um, applying for a mortgage in a zip code that has a high rate of defaults, that's a good example. That's bias based on un incomplete data. Confirmation bias, you know, data that might confirm, you know, our preconceptions. Again, we need to ensure that the data sets are complete, gender bias, all types of things that are, are unacceptable in society and things we wanna make sure are removed from the AI-based decision-making process. So we have the software I talked about, but leadership in this area goes beyond that. It also includes policies and practices. So as one example of a practice, we encourage all companies to create AI ethics boards. IBM has one as an example, and these are cross-disciplinary groups within a company representing different functions that are focused on both the technical and non-technical initiatives to operationalize trust, transparency, and fairness into all aspects of AI decision-making and creating AI policy and, and sticking to it and delivering on it. IBM, uh, you know, has something that we developed called our IBM Principles of Trust and Transparency. It, the, it's all about the guidelines and principles we follow to do things like protecting our clients' data and to ensure that there's trust and, and explainability in all aspects of what we do with AI. And then another way we contribute to that is in sharing code, if anybody's familiar with like the Linux Foundation and open source um, development of code. It's really a way to share code that IBM's developed in a free and open way so that developers can innovate and build on that technology. We donated something to the Linux Foundation called IBM's AI Fairness 360 Toolkit so that developers around the world can build that, innovate on it, and really help us to deal further with the issues of ensuring that we have open, transparent, and fair um, AI bias. And I'm, very pleased to say, I think IBM's done a terrific job uh, in that area, and I think the industry is doing a, a great job with it as well. Super, thanks for that. Lucas, go next. Uh, question mark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, hi, Tim, this is Lucas, and my question for you today is Will artificial intelligence increase or cut down job opportunities, especially in the fields of technology? Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Great, great question. Um, you know, look, when we consider like how we open the conversation today, you think about data being that, you know, quote unquote, um, natural resource of today. Companies, we did one study or actually something was a third party study, but they said due to the pandemic, companies are trying to do 10 years worth of digital transformation in a year. AI is just central to that, as is hybrid cloud. Um, so you can imagine the demand for those types of roles. It's actually creating a skills shortage. And in fact, one survey indicated that there's about 300,000 AI professionals around the world, but there's millions of open roles. So IBM and other companies, industries are trying to manage that skills shortage. Uh, Gartner, again, another one of these um, IT consultancy firms that we and others work with in the industry did a CIO survey. 54% of the CIOs viewed the AI skills gap as their biggest challenge. So roles like data scientists, statisticians, anyone with a, a data and analytics you know, specialty right now will be in very high demand. Now, Lucas, part of your question could have also gotten into AI replacing jobs, you know, the automation that's afforded there. We really haven't seen that in the ways we're applying AI. You know, we're seeing AI as freeing up workers for higher value work. And so one very good example is we have something called Watson Assistant, 
It uses AI as an intelligent agent to help with customer service in a variety of industries. We work with CVS and CVS is using Watson Assistant to and handle you know, literally millions of calls that are coming in on COVID-19. And you can think about the vaccine, questions on systems, you know, how, how do I get, you know, registered to make sure that I've got my vaccine credentials. All of those things are coming in. Watson Assistant's able to handle a lot of those questions. What does that do? It frees up uh, the CVS uh, staff uh, to handle the, the most complex and complicated questions that are coming in. So that's uh, a, a quick view of um, what we're seeing in the, the job market there. Yeah, and I suppose that's uh, a very popular concern, right? So I'm glad that I spoke about it. Now, one of the other things that we try to do in the class is to see what we can learn from others. And my next question will be about what can we learn from China? But then, Patrick, you could play that video with two examples of things which are interesting. Teachers at this primary school in China know exactly when someone isn't paying attention. These headbands measure each student's level of concentration. So, altogether, it seems like in China there is a tremendous amount of data which is great for artificial intelligence. Can you think of any examples or things that they're doing in China that we can learn? Uh, them. Yeah, let me give a little bit of background. Um, we actually did a report on the AI market in China. Now it's about three years old, so some of the data um, could be a little bit dated, but it's done by IBM's Institute for Business Value. This is a, a think tank that um, IBM runs a research arm that we have, and it talked about China's aspirations within AI. Um, a little bit of background on it. Um, it estimated that um, the China would be a $150 billion AI industry by the end of this decade. Um, China holds about 20% of the global data. Again, thinking back to um, data as that you know, next natural resource. There's a tremendous amount of value there. And they, um, at least in 2018 during the report, I had to check the latest data, but held the second number of AI uh, patents compared to uh, you know, other nations. So th those are, you know, some tremendous um, attributes to have. By the way, the survey was done with about 500 executives in China across um, 18 industries. And what we saw from the report um, was that they're taking a lot of the same actions that other nations are, uh, trying to address the skill shortage, which is, you know, something we talked about earlier. They're seeing the value of AI and things like customer service and automation. And of course, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the things that are happening um, with AI and IT in general are supported by several national agendas um, in, in China. Uh, when we looked at our IBM survey, just to give a few more senses of the things that they're looking to do with AI, so the top value drivers of AI were things like customer retention improvement, um, revenue growth for shorter sales cycles, you know, using AI to better target clients to drive better customer satisfaction, um, customer acquisition and cost reduction and speed to market. So a lot of focus there on AI systems to drive greater efficiency, faster predictions and things like that. Um, hold on one second. Some of the things are uh, you know, controversial and, and depends on where you are. Now let's go back to um, the part of your real good. And I think Regina, you have a question. On on, um, on this expert yeah. So hi team, I also want to ask the question on Olivia's behalf. And uh, she said, I saw in your LinkedIn profile that you managed a range of issue-based PR strategy. I'm wondering how can AI solve this issue? Thank you, Olivia. Um, yeah, I would add to you know the discussion we had about helping to manage and reduce and eliminate bias in AI. But another um, group of um, important examples, one is social services. And, you know, we know that caseworkers can spend as little as 20% of their time on human interaction. And you think about all the important social services in the world, things like healthcare, elder care, 
you know, veterans assistant. It's really important that that human interaction happens for counseling and, and assistance. So anytime you can take AI and take data-driven decision-making, paperwork, all those things, you can start to automate more of that. Obviously, you provide more time for those caseworkers to be out, um, you know, working with people. Another is in the area of uh, climate change, you know, one of the most important societal issues of our time. So we make AI software that helps our companies better do carbon accounting. And that's basically using AI to predict the amount of CO2 greenhouse gases a company is emitting and, and then help to develop plans to remediate them. You have to get a really good handle on the issue and the problem and the volume to do that. Also, in, we help clients with AI in, in terms of uh, in society, in terms of public safety. Uh, and you think about impending storms and weather events and hyperlocal forecasts that AI can study. I don't know how many of you are aware, but IBM owns the weather company. So every time you go to your phone and you're going to look up the weather forecast, if you use the weather company app, it says an IBM company next to it. And a lot of my friends would say, well, you know, why would IBM buy the weather company? Seems like a, you know, an unusual acquisition. Well, Again, it's all about the data, right? And you think that every company and every industry can be impacted by weather events, you know, impacts to the supply chain and other things. So we have AI software, something called our environmental intelligence suite that we combine with data from the weather company, supply chain data that we have from uh, our Sterling application, which is another software, uh, AI driven software application we have. It can coordinate all that data and help industries deal with weather events. If you're an energy company, you know, you may know of a hyperlocal forecast that hurricanes about to hit. You may have very sensitive equipment or power lines that you know will have to be, you know, the vegetation around them, the trees will have to be trimmed. There's very specific things you'll need to do ahead of time. So that's another example. And then another one is, is education. You know, there's AI teaching assistance George, I know you and others will, will know this very well. The most, one of the most valuable things in teaching is personalized learning. And so AI that can assist teachers in understanding the interests of students, the ways they prefer to learn, their learning traits, we can apply AI to enrich the, the learning experience as well. So those are a few examples. Yeah, I would love to learn more about uh, the one regarding your case, right? Because to your point, I know, I've already been doing this for two years, the different students learn differently, right? That I cannot generalize. Some, some of them, you know, prefer video, some of them prefer audio, some of them like in person, but others don't. Now, in that specific field, is the amount of data they have, you have a key factor, or it also makes a difference having, you know, great researchers to use that data in the example of education or in general, for artificial intelligence to, to succeed. Is it just data? Is it just intelligent people or you need both of them? Oh, you absolutely need both. And, and again, the whole idea behind data and AI, data management tools, those are the tools to gather the data and curate it. And the AI tools to help you in the decision-making process. Is there a means to go study the data and look at you know, different decisions and recommendations and predictions that humans will evaluate. You know, we would never rely on the systems alone to make decisions for us. It will always be a tool to help very smart people in the decision-making process. Thanks. Uh, that's, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, the next question is about what could happen if everything goes wrong. And this question is coming from one student in Europe. So, Hi, I'm Leo Huang and I'm currently in Helsinki, Finland. My question is as the following. As someone working closely with AI experts, what would you do if IBM systems stopped working for several hours, like what happened to Facebook last month? Thank you. Terrific question, Leo, and, and one that I've spent a lot of time on from a communications experience. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit more context. You can have systems outages where IT systems go down for a period of time due to whatever IT problem you have. This can also be caused by cyber attacks and cybersecurity events. I also support our security business from a communication standpoint. And we actually train and prepare for these types of outages within IBM, but we also 
provide services and consulting for our clients to deal with that as well. And so there's a lot of steps in training and preparing for events like this. It's something that no one wants to leave to, you know, to the last minute. And so to give you a sense of that, some of the things we recommend to clients that we do with IBM is it starts obviously with understanding and documenting and trying to anticipate the range of IT outages you can experience, the range of security threats, and really getting a detailed sort of roster of the things that might happen. Then the next thing we do with our clients is we work with them and we do this again within IBM on building really a playbook. And you can't underestimate the importance of a standardized, documented, repeatable action plan that can address the steps you need to take and the range of possibilities and scenarios that you may have to deal with. And then following up with that, like anything, you know, like, like, like fire drills in school, you have to rehearse and you have to train and prepare. And one great example is um, our security business in one of our offices in Boston has something called a cyber range. And I think if you Google it, IBM cyber range, IBM security and the NBC Today show, you'll see it in action. We had a couple of pieces on, on the Today show showing the training that happens there. We bring clients in, they're immersed in a very real experience they're dealing with a fictional company that experiences a cyber attack. They're literally taken through the experience and they go through the run books, the playbooks, how to react. And you know, and same could apply for an IT outage. And by the way, it's not just fixing the IT systems, eliminating the cyber attack. You could be getting calls from regulators, from the government, you could be getting calls from the media all different things. I mean, outages and tax can have implications on your, not only your financials, but on your reputation, on so many different aspect, aspects of your business. It's very important to go through and train for all these things. Couple other things that are really important in the equation, especially if it's a cyber attack, is leveraging threat intelligence. Again, threat intelligence in the cybersecurity sense is data on impending attacks. And so we have AI-driven security software that helps our clients do that. And being able to root out what's real and a false positive is very important. Our software does that. The, the more you root out false positives, the faster you'll get to the actual issue and remediate it. And then even automating uh, the investigations and response activities that you're doing via AI, via troubleshooting to bring AI into the equation to help you fix whatever the issue is faster and with as much accuracy as possible. So hi, I'm Devan. So for this question I want to ask, so for people who are working in communications, how much of their work relates to clients or external um, stakeholders compared to employees? Thank you. Great question. Um, We've got a number of disciplines within IBM communications, and we've got departments that both uh, specialize in employee communications and in social media, and of course with traditional media. I think from these classes, you've heard that we're managing communications by campaigns. And so that's really trying to get a consistent, coordinated message across five of the things that are most important to IBM. One of them is AI. I know you've heard from Kaveri and the other campaign leaders. Kaveri manages the and leads the hybrid cloud campaign. So we're not as focused on the ratio. I think it's probably equal in reaching all audiences. But what we want to do is ensure we're getting consistent messages to, to all audiences. What we do, by the way, and I apologize if this has been covered in previous classes, but in the campaigns is we're trying to mix both thought leadership. So you can think about things like surveys that we do that market some of the problems we're, we're, we're solving, say in AI, some of the issues our clients are dealing with. So we have data. You can think about bylines and op-eds. We pitch feature stories to the media, speaking engagements, driving that thought leadership as a narrative that connects the dots between the products and services announcements we make to the press, to employees, and to our business partners. So the most important thing with all of those issues is being able to be on the same page, consistent messaging, delivering what I'd call fact-based arguments, and 
all of that very equally valued skills within our company in terms of how to reach employees, the media, and a range of other uh, constituents um, outside of IBM as well. Thanks, Steve. Amanda, if you want to. Hello, Tim. This is Amanda, and I'll be asking a question on behalf of Tsuchi Zhang. So the question is, what effective strategies have you applied for internal communications, including alignment with employees during business updates? Thank you. Thank you. Great, great question. Look, as I mentioned, we manage IBM communications by campaigns. I've always said that if employees don't understand our strategy, they don't understand our differentiation in the market, our value proposition, our campaigns have failed. And I think it can make the argument that our most important um, audience is employees. So employee communications is very, very important. What we need and what I think we deliver is an effective mix of channels and tactics. I think the key is that the days of one-way communication are over. I think you can argue that virtually every employee communications tactic um, a company undertakes is social. And that's a very good thing because that dialogue and conversation is so much more, more valuable than one-way communication. And so whether that's corporate blogs, videos, town halls, AMAs, all social, even the emails we send out, they'll typically link to a blog or a video, but if they're sent to many people, there's room either to comment in another blog or even back and forth in the email. So that gives us feedback. It gives us, a, it gives us a, an opportunity for discussion, which is critical. We can respond to that feedback. If our employees don't understand an element of our strategy or our policy or a product, it enables us that feedback to answer them directly, socially, so more one-on-one -on -one personalized communication. But of course, it also enables us to adjust our communications messaging to employees and adjust our tactics. Again, our senior AMAs are a great example. Uh, our CEO, Arvind Krishna, runs regular AMAs, as do all of our senior execs. They're, they're a, a terrific discussion forum. They're very candid, open discussions about a range of topics in IBM where it really embodies a sense of communi community and um, collaborative communication. The other critical things with, with employee communications is we measure and adjust our employee communications just as we do, for example, with what we do with, um, with the media and with PR. And so we'll use measurements, things like reach or reaching the right employees, volume, key message pull through, that enables us again to go back and evaluate our results and adjust our, our messaging, adjust our programs um, to make sure that um, they're as effective as possible. <clears throat> One example now would be something that's called our Spotlight on AI. This is a web-based experience for all 250,000 IBM employees. We rotate these through some of our campaigns so our employees really get a sense of what's happening in key parts of our companies like AI. It's a series of um, very easy to digest, very social, lots of commentary going on, programs that, that have everything from videos to charts to graphs to blogs, talking about IBM's AI strategy, our products, dissecting you know, the value we provide to a client and a win, really trying to get into the aspects of how AI made one of our clients more productive, looking at um, our AI policy and how that's changing things in the world for the better and things like the future of AI, you know, what the things that our research labs are doing and what may happen in the future. And so we think that's a really important way to ensure that we're using the right sorts of employee, employee tactics and programs to make sure their employees are both very up to speed on what we're doing, motivated and feel rewarded and proud of the work that um, IBM is doing. Thanks, Tim. And now I think we have a question about a real-life example, right, Patrick? Chien. Yeah, there we go. Hi, team. This is Chien. Uh, my question for you is, could you give a real-life example about when communication solve a crisis? Thank you. Sure. I think um, that's a great question. I would say what we do in communications is all about influencing outcomes and that happens in a variety of spaces i know it mentioned a crisis and i can get to that but just to start from a very positive standpoint um, a, a great example is the work we do 
in promoting either our products or our solutions and clients that can either get interest from a client or in some cases even influence a, a buying decision. And so we, we know at times that our sales teams will come to us and they'll say, my client read a particular story or they watched a particular broadcast segment. They were very intrigued by what we were talking about, either in the services our people provide or in the, the benefits that our, our products can afford. And then they'll even come back to us at times and say, our solutions really, you know, our, our excuse me, our media coverage or press actually led to and helped influence that decision. I think there's no greater um, feeling when you're in communications in, in any company when you know you're helping to help a client, helping our sales team and drive revenue. A very good example, by the way, is I mentioned um, our security business. We have some of the preeminent cybersecurity experts in the world. We've done a lot of work to get them on broadcast TV. I mentioned the Today Show earlier, places like CNBC and Fox Business. When I meet with our, the heads of our sales teams for security, they tell me they take clips of our experts on TV and they bring them to clients. And they'll talk about some of the complex issues that our security experts are talking about. Maybe it's the latest ransomware attack and what companies need to do to think about defending themselves against that or the actions they should take if they're impacted by a ransomware attack and what to do about it. And they'll tell them that this is the caliber of people that you'll work with. In fact, you can even work with the person that we just had in broadcast. And that really helps with sales. We do, um, to the earlier point in the question, deal with a lot of issues-based PR. As I mentioned, every company deals with issues. The biggest way we can help with that is by getting IBM's position out, you know, fact-based, very, you know, articulate examples of, of what IBM is dealing with and IBM's, you know, uh, the way IBM is handling a given issue. And by the way, I'd also say in, in like helping with outcomes and influencing outcomes in IBM, I think communications plays a really key role in bringing key teams together. You think about our strategy team, our product development teams, marketing, legal, and others, where we help shape and agree on not only the story we're telling, but sometimes even our strategy in terms of the way we'll, you know, take a market to product and, um, and the way we'll, you know, the overall story we'll tell. So a lot of work um, in terms of influencing, you know, outcomes within communications. Thanks, Tim. So we have three questions about career and, you know, what you guys in communications do. And I also see some questions are coming up from the, um, from the Q&A. So let's go with these three questions. First, Patrick, can you play the first one? And then we go to the other ones. Hi, Tim. This is Sheng Yu, and I'm asking, what does someone do in communications? At IBM Cloud and Data, what is the specific role of communications? Thank you for that question. Um, several things, I think I've mentioned some of them already, but I think fundamentally the role in communications is to positively influence a variety of audiences. We've mentioned the media and employees, but it's also clients, it's business partners. You know, IBM works with a lot of resellers that provide you know, value to our clients, a lot of different um, independent software vendors and others systems integrators, we want to get our message there about why it's valuable to work with IBM in terms of their clients, in terms of how they can make money um, working with IBM, uh, dealing of, with communicating our, our strategy, our products, our services, and our policies. As I mentioned, key part of it is defending the IBM brand and issues management. Um, as we said, like every other company, we can deal with product issues, you know, lawsuits, cyber attacks, that's one of the skills. Advice and counsel to senior executives um, on communications related issues is another area. Um, I think, again, another root um, uh, foundational type of skill we're looking for and that we're deploying is very strong storytelling skills. You think about what IBM does. We're really a B2B company, but and we deal with some very complex topics. You know, we talked about things like AI ops today and zettabytes, like who knows what all that means, right? How do you translate that into things that, you know, what IBM does is a downstream benefit to both consumers and society. So being able to translate 
what we do into ways that has mass appeal is very, very important. What I call, again, a fact-based argument, as I mentioned, we do, like, as an example, an AI adoption index, a survey we do every year. And we try to look at the things that our clients are really, they're really trying to overcome or, or the issues that they're, they're trying to get to. You know, I mentioned some data before, 90% of data is unanalyzed. We can use that data um, to basically market the problems that our clients are dealing with. And then we'll have more fact-based data that shows the benefits of our products. I mentioned earlier, our AI products can help clients get to data-driven predictions 50% faster. All of that's important. Um, we employ, as I mentioned earlier, PR specialists. We have social media strategists and specialists, speech writers, employee communications specialists. In terms of what I do in, in, um, in data, in our data and cloud platform business, that's IBM's software business. So it's really in communicating the role that our software plays. It has heavy AI components, as well as um, components for hybrid cloud. My role is really to ensure we've got a cohesive strategy across our outreach to all audiences. I have people on my teams that work on our you know, PR work. We work on employee communications. It's to advise our senior executives. And my primary role, the way we're organizing the company now is as the leader of our AI campaign. And so one example is we have regular calls with our communications professionals around the world to talk about what's coming up, to talk about what we need to focus on and to help with any issues that may be arising in, in communications for AI across the company. Thanks, Steve. That's helpful. That is helpful. Yeah, that's cool. So hi team, this is Vanessa, and I'm asking this question on behalf of Blaker. She says, I have noticed that you have spoken with many publications over the years. Before such interviews, how did you prepare? Did you go over company numbers, strategies, and agenda, or did you always feel well prepared as you have a background in PR? Thank you. Great, thank you. Very, very good. <laughs> very, very good question. Um, it's both, uh, when, when I think back to the question, there's a base level of PR skills, you know, we have on the team, most of the people that, uh, all of the people we bring in usually have a background in a degree in either communications, public relations, a lot of the disciplines that we mentioned earlier. So that's sort of the foundation that our employees work on. But there's an enormous amount of preparation that goes into, uh, you know, dealing with a media interview and getting our executives and our experts prepared for media interviews. And when we speak with the media on a variety of topics. And so what's really important is the work that leads up to an announcement with issues management, with all the things we may want to communicate um, to the media. So we work with a variety of departments. We work with business development, you know, we work with marketing, we work with legal on the development of materials to help us prepare for that interaction. And that's things you'd think about like, you know, press releases and the story we want to help share with the media. It's also in Q's and A's, you know, we want to anticipate any Q and A that could be asked to make sure that we have very thoughtful answers for the variety of, of questions that we may have. And I think as a result of that, um, we're, we're fairly, you know, well prepared as we, we come into that, into those different types of situations. And again, I think it's those skills. And one of the good things about IBM is if there's a given topic area, and I have worked in many different areas within IBM, we bring people in, you have the, the press skills, you have the communication skills. We give them the, you know, we afford them the opportunity to learn the job, you know, getting them with the right people, getting them with the right experts, studying the right materials ahead of time. And you know, so there's a little bit of on the job training there to understand the business. And, you know, we won't start someone off with, you know, the most complex announcement or the most difficult issue. We sort of help them graduate uh, as they move along through the process. Thanks, Tim. And uh, the last question is from Melody. Hi, Tim. My name is Melody Na, and I was impressed when I saw your LinkedIn profile that you have been serving for both the IBM Financial Services 
and IBM System Business as a communicator and PR director. So I was wondering how you have been learning all those informations because I believe uh, the media coverage are different for both finance services and cloud platforms. Also, were there any challenges that you have been experiencing when transitioning to another department? Could you share us some tips also? Thank you. Thank you for that, that question. Um, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've had a variety of different roles within IBM and um, I did go from, I think, financial services to system to our software business. It's one of the reasons I love working at IBM. There's such a diversity of different opportunities where like many different businesses, many different companies within, within one larger company. Um, but it does take time, as I mentioned earlier, that on the job training. So when I started in financial services, the company afforded me the time to go meet with all of our experts. It was a lot of studying. I had help. My manager at the time would, would help me, uh, you know, if there are incoming inquiries to move forward. So that is the great thing about working in communications at IBM. We get that, we get that time and that leeway and that freedom to learn as, as we move forward. I think a good example of, you know, one of the toughest transitions I had to make was really my first VP job within communications. And it was in managing our communications for our North America sales organization. And that was a whole different universe for me as someone that had done a lot of communications work, employee communications, working with the media, speech writing, a variety of different assignments, really more on the product and services side of tech and understanding that and you could say, well, you're selling products and services through sales, very true. But this particular job was focused on our sales processes. There's very different terminology in sales, what motivates sellers, you know, the inner workings of our seller organization really took me, you know, a while to learn again, but I was afforded that opportunity. I spent an awful lot of time with our sales leaders, spent time with sellers, you know, shadowing them, figuring out each day how that process worked. The other challenge for me was not as much media work in our sales organization. It's really all about helping our sellers sell and with education, educational events and sales rallies and things. So I was a little bit more on the side of employee communications, which I've done a lot of, but just a different type of, of job for me. But looking back on it, it, it was great. I mean, it was really a good opportunity for me to just see another perspective of not only the company, but the industry and being able to understand all of that, I think has is, is helped me in my career. Thanks so much. In, look, uh, the students have made a video to thank you on this moment. We will have loaded and a good send it to you. And I'll just pass it back to Michael since we're two minutes late. But on behalf of the entire class, students joining from Asia and Europe and from here in New York City. I would like to thank you very much. Thank you all. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Yes, well, I, uh, Tim, I just want to add my uh, v vote and voice of, of thanks to you and to IBM for joining us uh, today. Um, you know, the field of AI is one that fascinates us all and you know, we're very appreciative that you can share some perspectives from IBM. And I was taking copious notes and learned a lot. And uh, also, you know, sharing some aspects of what you do as a senior communicator in that field, which is, you know, the types of roles that many of our students aspire to. So I just want to thank you uh, wholeheartedly on behalf of all of us at uh, School of Professional Studies here at NYU. So uh, look forward to having you back uh, in the classrooms or, you know, uh, chatting about uh, opportunities for our students. So. Thank you, Michael. Much appreciated.